lives in Africa and one lives in India, or one lives in England and one lives in Arizona, that's okay, they can coexist that way. But you put them all together and they wouldn't all coexist. Okay, so what about plants? Okay, plants also do resource partitioning. So I think you all remember that um, I used to direct a big research project on birds of prey in the tropical forest down in Central America. And one thing that we did, we also studied the tree community, which was a lot of fun. So there's well over 100 species of trees that occur in that forest. And it's a very gentle terrain. Uh, what you have is from low-lying swales to hills that are not much bigger, really gentle hills that might be only 50 feet taller or 30 feet taller than the nearby low areas. But there's a gradient in soil types so on the hills, the soils are rocky, they're well drained, they don't get waterlogged. They're, they're rich in organic matter, they're relatively fertile, and the pH is nice and uh, neutral. These low-lying areas actually, during the rainy season, they become flooded. You can be wading in water up to your neck for a, a period of months they remain flooded. But then in the dry season, they dry out totally and the soil there is more like a really deep clay and you've probably seen how the clay soil when it gets really dry it cracks up into big cracks right clay holds on to the water really tightly so plants have a lot of trouble getting water from clay so plants down here it's kind of weird uh, in the rainy season they're practically drowning and in a dry season it's like they live in a desert so that's a very extreme environment these green curves are uh, species occurrence curves for different tree species. Now obviously I just drew those but that's kind of what it really looks like. So there's a series of tree species that occur only in these what we call Bajo areas and there's some that occur pretty much only in uh, the upper hill slopes and then there's a, tur there's a constant turnover of tree species so no two species reach their, op reach this, reach their highest density at a single point, right? There's differences in every one of those more than 100 species as to where they occur simply along this environmental gradient, which is it's a composite gradient of soil type, soil moisture, and so on. Okay? So that's, that's pretty interesting. <coughs> and undoubtedly that may result, at least in part, from competition in the past so that they don't all use the same resources. right? Okay, there's another thing that goes on in forests that you probably never thought about. That I never really had thought about this until I started working down there. And one of the students on this project was really into plant ecology. And so we did this big study of the trees and I learned a lot from him. So one thing, there, there's also separation in the way that different trees in the forest regenerate. In other words, uh, where they drop their seeds and when and how the seeds uh, germinate and when and how the trees grow after that, especially with respect to the availability of light. Okay? Light is a limiting resource in the tropical forest. Okay? So uh, here's another thing that you may not be aware of. In a mature forest, it's not just homogeneous. You have a lot of tree falls. Okay? Big trees will fall down and they will create an area maybe in half an acre in size or different depends on the size of the tree. But what you get then is a light gap where the canopy is left open and the light gets in. Okay? I didn't draw this like a very big gap, but here's a tree that fell down and here's a light gap. So trees fall into several different sort of guilds. A guild is a group of species um, that uses um, uses a certain resource in a similar way. So there are guilds with respect to light usage and regeneration. So for example, um, this is a species that the seeds will only germinate in a light gap. They won't germinate in the deep shade under the forest canopy, right? And then these are species that grow very rapidly and um, don't necessarily live very long won't get super tall, won't become part of the tree canopy, probably won't live more than 20, 30 years. 
Balsa wood, you all know balsa wood. It's really light, right? Balsa wood is this kind of a species. Why is that wood so light? Well, it's a really cheap, it's a fast growing tree and it gets as tall as it can quickly to get a lot of light. And in so doing, it makes this really cheap, light sort of wood. Very different from a very dense mahogany or something uh, that the more slower glowing trees create this incredibly dense hardwoods that are valuable for furniture and whatnot. Anyway, so that's one extreme. These are light gap specialists. It would be kind of like a dandelion that grows in the forest. It needs this disturbance, goes very rapidly, but it won't last long there. As that gap fills in, that tree has completed its life cycle, it sends seeds elsewhere, and it doesn't live long. Okay. On the other extreme, there are trees whose seeds will germinate under even in the deep shade of the mature forest in the, in the understory, right? They may regenerate there. And some of those species, the saplings, will go ahead and grow. They don't require a lot of light, and they will very slowly grow in the dim light conditions, and they may eventually get up into the canopy. Okay, all these trees, their goal sort of more, if you could think of them as having a goal, is to get up into the canopy in large part. So that's the other extreme, and then in between, there are species whose saplings will generate, the seeds will germinate, and they will grow a little bit in the shade, but then they kind of just stand there and they don't grow bigger until there's a tree fall gap that exposes them to the light, and then they will take off and they will rapidly grow higher. So the, those are just three points along a spectrum, but there's a whole spectrum of regeneration techniques where plants are doing things differently. Well, what about pollination and seed dispersal? Not only do plants differ in these techniques, but they can actually end up competing. Different plants can compete for pollinators, and they can compete for seed dispersers. So let's talk about pollination. A lot of plants are pollinated by the wind, like grasses are pollinated by wind. Uh, pine trees are pollinated by wind. If you've ever noticed, if you go up in the mountains in the summer, you may notice after a few hours parked in the edge of the forest, your, tr your car will be covered with a really fine yellowish powder, and that's pollen from the pine trees, right? There's bazillions of pollen grains floating around. But as you also know, many plants are pollinated by insects and bats and birds, okay? Um, this is... This is a case of coevolution between the plant and the pollinator. And it's also a case of mutualism where both the plant and the pollinator benefit. Well, if you think about it for a moment, what is a flower? Okay. Well, a flower is a structure that plants have evolved in order to manipulate some animal into pollinating them. Okay. That's the only reason for a flower to exist. The colorful nature of the flower is just a signal to help the animal to recognize it, but what's the reward? What's, what, what's the reward when, why does the bee go to the flower? Or why does the hummingbird go to the flower? Who knows? You all know, yeah? For, for the nectar, right? This basically the sugar water reward. So for the most part, the insects are attracted to the flowers to get a sugar water reward. So that's the benefit to the insect. And of course, the plant um, has evolved all this. The reward for the plant is pollinating, is, is mixing its pollen with other individuals, okay? And this is common, there's birds and bats evolved. These cases are co-evolved. There are some cases where it's a really neat co-evolution. For example, uh, there is an orchid in Madagascar that big island off of Africa. I don't need to draw it, but this orchid, it's a white flower and it has a spur. It has like a spur that comes down, it's almost 10 inches long. And when Darwin first saw that flower, he predicted, ah, there's a hawk moth out there with a tongue exactly that long. A hawk moth is uh, also called sphinx moths. You may see them around here in the evening in the summer. They look like a hummingbird. They, they hover really fast and they go, you know, from flower to flower. And he was right, there's a hawk moth there that's co-evolved with that particular orchid and it has a tongue exactly that long. So sometimes it's a 
species to species coevolution. Sometimes it's not that tight. Um, God, we got like two minutes. All right. So at any rate, it's coevolution and it's mutualism. Okay, both parties benefit. Um, and plants can compete and divide up the the pollinators. Seed dispersal, same deal. Some of them are wind dispersed, like those maple seed helicopter things. But as you know, <clears throat> lots of seeds are dispersed by animals. The sticky ones that get in your socks when you go up in the foothills. But what is a fruit? Okay, A fruit is a structure a plant has evolved in order to manipulate an animal into dispersing its seeds. Okay, Many times, the animal that eats the fruit either drops the fruit somewhere, drops the seed somewhere, or more likely, the seeds go through the digestive tract of the animal and then they germinate after the, out of the poop later on. Meanwhile, the, the uh, bat or the bird or other animal, the monkey, has dropped those seeds somewhere else. Some seeds won't germinate unless they have been through somebody's digestive tract. So that again is a case of uh, mutualism and coevolution. So I know that was kind of quick, but those are a few of the key points of community ecology that make it so interesting. By the way, it's probably safe to say that every significant question in community ecology remains unanswered. Okay? We have a few things that we really know for sure, uh, mostly general patterns, but a lot of details that we don't really know, we don't really understand, and that's what makes it so interesting as a field to be involved in. All right, guys, thank you very much for your attention, and Rowan, thanks for taking that.